Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another uh, ground segment business, business unit uh, seminar. So uh, today we have a great, a very generous offer from Tiago Fernandes uh, to give us a, 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 small, a short course uh, in 20 minutes about astro, astro, astrophotography. Um, so Tiago already shared the, the link to his new YouTube channel uh, in the chat with us so that you can uh, follow him uh, afterwards. And uh, so let's start, Tiago, you have 20 minutes um, right. and then some uh, moments for question and answer. Thank you. So you can see my screen? Yes. Okay. So. Um... Close this part. Okay. Okay. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this astrophotography for people in a hurry. Uh, quick seminar. Um, so, just going right into it because it's a very complex uh, topic. Uh, just a quick introduction. So, who am I? I'm Tiago. I'm currently working in the um, data systems division. I'm um, space geek and a gaming geek, and I've been doing astrophotography uh, for almost three years now, when I bought my first serious telescope, and I've been absolutely hooked to astrophotography since I took my very, very first picture uh, with the Samsung S7, so quite an old phone actually, uh, and this is one of the first pictures that I took, so I believe it's quite um, self-explanatory why I was hooked ever since I saw the, um, the glimpse of the craters on the moon and the shadows. Uh, casting this beautiful painting, if you want, of the moon. So this is an example of what you can get with very simple beginner stuff. Uh, and it's quite addictive, uh, as I can <laughs> surely testify. So just to give you an idea of my, what I use uh, currently, this is more of advanced gear. So my first telescope was actually the, the one on the left, uh, which is a, a rather big one. Um, that allowed me to, to take the pictures from the moon. But right now my main imaging setup is the one on the right with all the cables, because there are a lot of cables in this hobby uh, that evolve with it, a dedicated astro computer, a guiding camera, dedicated astro sensor, and, and uh, a lot more stuff that I can't go into right now. So what is astrophotography? So you have the basic uh, boring answer straight out from the Wikipedia, but in truth, it can be almost anything. It can be the scientist that took the picture from the black hole uh, four years ago, uh, or it can be a child playing in the background with their parents' camera and just taking pictures of the night sky. Uh, as a curiosity, the first astrophoto was taken of the moon in 1840. Uh, I believe there was an attempt done the year before, but it came out very blurry. But for historical reasons, first astrophoto, 1840. And that astrophotography nowadays uh, is more closely associated with amateur uh, activity, but it, it also has connections to what is done professionally in observatories. Why we do this? So there are long and cold nights. Uh, there are equipment setups that can be very frustrating. One error can ruin the whole session. And what, for people from uh, like us from IT, uh, we understand the, the pain that is um, single points of failure. And with astrophotography, there are multiple points of failure. So it can be quite frustrating uh, sometimes. And it can be very, very lonely, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, but the thing is, um, Ever since I remember that everything, ever since I took my first picture of Saturn and Jupiter, I was jumping around like a little five-year-old. So for me, that's the reason why I do it, to recapture that childlike wonder uh, as an adult. And that's my motivation. But each one of you, when you try out, if you want to try this out, uh, you will find your own motivations, your own uh, personal thing to push you forward. So just some quick concepts, uh, types of astrophotography, object catalogs, and types of objects. In terms of types of astrophotography, the most basic one are star trails. Star trails uh, can be a really good uh, example um, to show, especially for, for little kids, but also for adults, of the Earth's rotation. So as you know, the, the, the Earth rotates around an axis that does not match um, with the ecliptic of the solar system. And if you take just short but uh, continuous long exposures uh, of the night sky, you will get this effect and it can be really beautiful uh, both as artistic and also as an educational tool. They are very beginner friendly, minimum preparation required and very little gear. Just need a camera, you can set it on the ground, set it on top of a wall or whatever and just take pictures for a long time. 
Then you have landscape astrophotography, also a little preparation, very beginner friendly, very little gear, but you already need some software experience to, to mess around with your camera settings. And it can be anything that captures both the night sky and some foreground objects. In this case, I took a picture with some trees and it's not very, very um, elaborate by my standards nowadays. But when I took this picture like two years ago, it was amazing to, to see that I captured the Pleiades on the top right, for example. Then you have planetary, which is more involved. So you actually need a bit more gear, still very beginner friendly. Um, uh, you need uh, like a long focal length telescope because these objects are very tiny, they are very bright, but they are very tiny in the night sky. Some, so some um, investment in focal lengths, either with the lens or a telescope is required. And then you have the deep sky, which are the, <laughs> I call them the heavyweights uh, of astrophotography. That requires uh, some experience, it requires preparation, it requires planning and also software uh, experience. Uh, but even a uh, less than ideal result can be quite amazing. Uh, as you can see here, this is a horsehead nebula for those who know it. Um, nowadays, I consider this picture to be somewhat horrible uh, by my standards, but uh, even with uh, less than ideal conditions, it can be quite amazing to see that picture in your, in your camera for the first time. But how do we find these objects? So you can either go old school and uh, consult star charts or magazines or online, or you can do just like I do, which is using apps like Stellarium, which is a, a free planetarium software that gives you, you input your location and it gives you the, um, the night sky uh, at whatever specific time you wish. So this is a really great uh, way to, to find stuff in the night sky. And some object catalogs. So many of these objects are already cataloged. So we're not really discovering anything new. Some exceptions apply. But mostly as a beginner, you have two great catalogs, which is the Messiah catalog and the Caldwell catalog, which contain objects like the Horsehead Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, the Ryan Nebula, and many others. Um, these two in conjunction are over 200 objects. And then you have the NGC and the IC catalogs, which contain over 12,000 objects. They are more for advanced usage, but they, they have many beautiful sites in them. And now what type of objects are up there? So the, the, the most common one are nebulae. So you have the planetary nebulae, which are remnants of a solar system like ours will be one day. You have emission nebula, which are locations for star formation. You have reflection nebulae, which are like clouds of huge gas that are illuminated by background or foreground stars. You have dark nebulae, which are a filament uh, of interstellar dust that uh, you can see as a highlight uh, in contrast with other nebulae. For example, the horsehead nebula is an example. The horsehead itself is a dark filament, which is illuminated by the background emission nebula, the red no one, and that gives us the, the illusion of the, of the horsehead. And then you have supernova remnants, which are the remnants of big explosions in space that seed out building blocks of life everywhere in the universe. You can also do planetary and solar, like Jupiter, Saturn, the Moon, and even the Sun. Uh, but I do want to, to caution everyone in regards to solar, because it requires research, it requires preparation, it requires specific protection gear. Do never attempt to look at the Sun without the adequate protection, uh, because at best, you will burn out your equipment really quickly. And at worst, you will pierce your eye in like five seconds flat. So this is something I really want to caution about. So never stare at the Sun without a proper protection. Then you have galaxies. So galaxies are a strange uh, target because they can vary very they can vary a lot by in size and uh, and shape. Uh, for example, the Andromeda galaxy, which is like two and a half million light years away, it's really big. It's like six times the, the, the size of the full moon in the night sky. And then you have the Whirlpool and the Pinwheel galaxy, which are 20, 21, 22 million light years in the in the Big Dipper. Uh, and they are very, very tiny, like uh, compared to, to Saturn or Jupiter. And uh, they can be a really challenging um, target in relation to the Andromeda galaxy. And then you have star clusters like the Pleiades that can be really beautiful. Even the small clumps of, uh, of stars can be really beautiful to capture. And I like the Pleiades a lot because of these uh, blue lines of dust. And this actually gives me the perfect segue into my next topic, which is light pollution. So light pollution, uh, it's the bane of uh, astrophotography after clouds. 
uh, caused by street lights and other parasitic light sources. Uh, on the left, you can see an image that most of us are pr probably very familiar with, uh, which is a beautiful sight from space. But when you are on the ground on these cities and you try a locking exposure, uh, it completely washes over uh, your image. There are some techniques. Uh, there are specific filters that you can use to reduce this, but there is really no substitute for a dark sky location. And luckily, there are associations like the Dark Sky Association, uh, which uh, are trying worldwide to change how people are related to light pollution and trying to regain the night sky because if you live in the city nowadays you you except for the really bright stars you don't really have a night sky which is, is really sad and if you have the opportunity to to travel uh, to one of the dark sky uh, sites in portugal we have three i do not know in spain but if you do have the the opportunity go there because you will not be disappointed and we measure light pollution in terms of the portal scale. So this is a, an algorithm, uh, algorithmic uh, scale. I live in a seven to eight uh, portal sky. So it, it's already done an impact. And you can see on the right, the map of light pollution throughout Europe. So it, it, for, for me, it looks like a bacteria growth and uh, it's, it's beginning to, to be a problem. And as an example, so on the left, you have a picture of Andromeda, which I took with 15 minutes of exposures. And on the right, you have a picture of Andromeda I took well over an hour. So the, the, the amount of light pollution in your sky really makes a difference in the quality uh, of your pictures. And now just going for a basic year because we're short on time. Um, so if you want to try this out, what should you do? So DSLR, uh, commercial camera available is the way to go. It's a cheaper solution for beginners. It's the most user-friendly for, for beginners. And there are many secondhand purchases that are quite good, but some care needs to be taken in regards to sensor health, uh, just to make sure that the, the camera is in good condition, good condition for low light conditions. And smartphone astrophotography can also be a very uh, viable solution. It requires just some inventive uh, mount support, like the one I have on the right. And I took a few pictures of the Milky Way this summer, uh, just trying it out with the, with this setup. And this is astrophotography. So use whatever you have. The, the astrophotography is not about the gear, it's about the subject. So uh, the most important thing is to enjoy yourself while doing this. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to be out in the cold. In regards to support, so it really depends on what you're shooting. So for a beginner, you mostly will do star trailing, landscape, uh, astrophotography. So the only thing you will need is some support to place your camera on. And unless you're doing uh, it, long exposures that result in star trailing, do not concern yourselves with specialized gear. Uh, there are some smaller tracking mounts, such as a sky guider or a star adventure, uh, but these are considered quite an investment. So my, my, my advice to beginners, no, do, do not look into this right now. Just go outside, use what you have and just see if it, if it fits you. And as my own example, so I started out with a Canon 60D as second hand. Uh, I already had the, the Kint lens, but new ones can go for 100 euros or if you want to go for a fixed 50 millimeter uh, lens, which is called the Nifty 50 from uh, Canon, you can go for 150 euros. I bought a, a carbon fiber tripod for 100 euros, the SD card, and I'm ready to go. This is an investment. So before you you invest into this, uh, see, ask for friendly and friends if they have some camera that you can borrow, just so you can try it out for yourself before purchasing this. And sadly, these are more advanced topics of where we are on, won't be able to go into right now. So location selection, stacking uh, your images in post-processing, actual post-processing, uh, filters, and many, many others. We don't have time to go into these right now, but this is a very complex, very deep subject. So feel free to reach out for me, either at cor my corporate address or if you want later uh, in my social media, feel free to, to reach out and I will uh, share with you what I know. Just some notes. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that no two works of astrophotography are the same. So uh, people will develop their own style. Some people prefer to, to exaggerate some colors. Some people prefer very soft touches. Some people prefer to really work on their pictures and it's all fine. Find your own style, have fun with it because unless you're striving for scientific uh, accuracy, you have ample artistic license to 
make your own experiences, make your own experiments and have fun with it. Uh, and this is something I really want to, to mention is that have fun with it. Otherwise, it really doesn't make sense to be doing this. So what can you expect? You expect simple pictures like this. Um, this is a single photo I took with my Canon. I, we, I was out with some friends. We stopped in the middle of the road. I got out, put the camera on top of the car, took a picture of the night sky and came out this. And for example, here on the top middle, uh, this is actually Andromeda Galaxy, which I was quite surprised to realize later that I had captured it. So even this, it, it's a simple, um, simple result, but it can be very, very good for, for a beginner. You can, take, you can try your luck at stacking. Uh, this is an experiment I did uh, this summer comparing uh, the commercial DSLR with my smartphone. And even the smartphone, it, it clearly loses the competition, but even the smartphone, the result is quite good for a beginner. You can, you can get better pictures and it's like this one, which I was actually quite lucky to get because the atmospheric scene on that night was just perfect. And I actually was able to create this wallpaper of the moon, uh, which I was very, very surprised and, and very satisfied that I got. You can also do experiments such as this, uh, which is capturing the earth shine. So earth shine is when the sun reflects, reflects off of the, of the earth's oceans and onto the dark side of the moon. If you, if you do a long exposure of the moon, where is a quarter crescent, um, you can actually capture this, uh, the glow uh, on the dark side. So this is quite a, an interesting um, experience to do. And you will have mistakes. So in this case, I tried to make a long exposure of the Milky Way and I, I got a lot of st uh, star trails. But even this can tell you that, okay, there is stuff up there. Uh, I can improve my skills, I can improve my experience, and I can work on this to, to get better results in the future. So even with mistakes, you will learn. And I would say you will learn more from the mistakes, from the successes, because when the success, you think, oh, I'm the greatest. And when you make mistakes, okay, I need to learn. Um, this is also an example of a nebula, the Rosette Nebula, uh, that I took a few years, uh, two years ago, uh, and you can see the camera noise uh, present in this image. So this is why I was mentioning that you need to, to be careful with when you're purchasing a secondhand camera to make sure that the sensor is uh, healthy in order to avoid this extra sensor noise that can somewhat ruin your, your pictures in the end. And now just for some final words, uh, uh, and I think I'm okay for time right now. Uh, so um, this is a quote I adapted from uh, Blade Runner, uh, one of my favorite sci-fi quotes, which is tears in the rain. So I've seen things most people wouldn't believe, and I will apologize right now for the cliched attempted at poetry. Uh, I've seen barrelless and lifeless worlds that still have their own beauty. I've seen distant places uh, where other humanities might exist. I've seen stars fading from existence with one final showdown. And I've seen others spreading the building blocks of other worlds. All of these moments are up there waiting for you to witness them. So get out and enjoy the night sky. You can find me on Tiago's Night Skies on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And thank you very much for your time. I wish you a very Merry Christmas with this image of the uh, Christmas tree cluster. And uh, I will end this with the customary salutation in the astrophotography community, which is wishing you all clear skies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tiago. Well, uh, before we open to questions, let me say that this is really fascinating. And uh, uh, you were very, um, you're very good with time, but we, I think we need more time <laughs> to, to have a proper uh, class yes, this, on this. This is a very complex topic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I think it is interesting for all the demos people. So maybe we can find you. I know that we want to relaunch free ideas and uh, maybe we can find you sometime to share sure. more about this with us. Sure, I love okay. that challenge. <laughs> good. But thank you, thank you very much. It was very good. And My now pleasure. let's let's open for questions or comments. David Petit. No question really, just saying, uh, yeah, amazing picture. It's a very good motivation for anybody to do some astrophotography. Uh, I'm very impressed by the pictures and uh, yeah. 
I think I will start next year. <laughs> Thank you. That's great to hear. <laughs> okay, more questions or comments? Uh, yeah, I've got a quick question. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you, Tiago. It's very interesting, very beautiful pictures. Um, is there anything you could tell us about the processing you do of these images? Like, is there dedicated software for it, or is it something you can do in Python? Uh, yes. So that that's one of the topics we don't have time to 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 address in much detail. So there are specific softwares. Um, first one for what we call stacking. So stacking is the process by which we increase the signal to noise ratio of the of the final images, just reduce the camera noise at the very minimum. And afterwards, there is specific software that we use for processing. So um, usually you have either Photoshop, if you're more uh, used to using it. You also have GIMP, dark tables, which are free uh, alternatives. And then you have the the flagship software of the astrophotography community, which is called PixInsight. Uh, it's a commercial license, and it can, it's done by astrophotographers, by astrophotographers for astrophotographers, and it contains many tools to to bring out to the the subtle detail. Because the truth is, these are very some of these uh, they are very faint objects, and you need the, some work, some image editing in order to be able to to bring out those details. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, another question or comment? David Petit again? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, for the pictures of Saturn and Jupiter, you have shown uh, at the very beginning. So, did you use uh, stacking and some long exposure? What kind of uh, gear did you have for this? Okay, so for those first pictures, I was completely unaware of what stacking even was at the time. So I think at the time I just took some, I do I did the technique that actually many observatories also use it sometimes, which is lucky imaging. So lucky imaging, uh, basically you, instead of taking pictures, you take video uh, of these objects because they are very bright, but they are very tiny. The issue with their being very tiny is that they are very sensitive to atmospheric seeing. So the, the turbulence in the atmosphere, which is something that, for example, the Hubble or, Hubble or the James Webb telescope won't have to deal with, but yet it's like watching uh, a coin at the bottom of a lake uh, when there is turbulence. So uh, very often you, you have the distorted image, but every so often you get this perfect moment where the, the seeing is just perfect. So that's why we take videos. We take a huge amount of frames and then we just select the best ones. Uh, nowadays, for example, the, 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 the big picture of the moon that I showed at the end was done like this. So I did a, a video of the moon and then I selected the, the best frames uh, and stacked them all together uh, in order to get that sharp images. So I suppose if you're using stacking nowadays, you would get an even better image of Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, yes, and it's one of my plans. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we still have four minutes. So if you want to uh, make more comments. Um, yeah, I've got another yes. one. Mm -hmm. uh, this is maybe a more general question, um, but do you have any opinions on the, the planned like super constellations of like lower orbiting satellites like uh, Starlink and stuff uh, and how that might affect astrophotography? That's actually one of the most common questions I get asked. Um, the thing is, okay, so um, it's a it's a touchy subject. So I, I can tell you right now that, for example, for my most advanced pictures, I usually take around five minute exposures, and during those five minutes with super constellations like Starlink, uh, it's common to get some star trail, some satellite trails across the image, uh, which sometimes they can ruin an image. The thing is, using the algorithms that we usually use for stacking, um, most of these algorithms, unless unless it's a repetitive um, uh, trail across your image, the software itself can average out the the added noise from that uh, from that satellite passing, and it doesn't really make an impact on your final image. But I can, I can uh, even though for astrophotography, uh, it doesn't really impact, uh, I can say that there is a case being done for maybe we don't 
need to to fill out the sky with mega constellations. Uh, so it, it's a very touchy subject and very personal uh, in terms of opinion. But for me, it doesn't really impact, but it doesn't mean for others won't impact. So <laughs> that's all I can really say about it. Yeah, no, that's, no, that's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, I guess it'll get even more interesting once Amazon get their constellation up there as well. Uh, as long as just Starlink, I don't think it will be an issue, but <laughs> everyone else starts to put mega constellations yeah. up there, then we might see some issues in the night sky, yeah. yes. Yeah, no, definitely. All right, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, um, still time for questions. So Tiago was so kind to leave us time enough for a discussion. <laughs> so more comments or questions? Tiago, I know, I, I'm, I'm sure that you have two Davids that will follow you, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe more. People, are, people that are quiet maybe will try it too. Uh, what I just want to say is that I really mean it when I say that I will share whatever I know um, with, with all my heart because I really enjoy this uh, hobby. And uh, if anyone just doesn't want to ask here in this forum, feel free to contact me at my address and uh, we can discuss this further. <laughs> I just, uh, hello, oh, sorry. Hello. Uh, I have a, just a comment just saying it looks really amazing. And I okay. really hope that you get to do all your great goals in the astrophotography. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else? I think this is shared by any, everyone, so consider it, consider that we all said this. <laughs> um, okay, if not, people will sure, surely contact you outside of the um, of the meeting, and we reach um, eleven o'clock um, CET time. So thank you very much, Tiago. Really good. And uh, we'll surely repeat this, repeat and extend this uh, in another sure. forum because it's uh, very interesting and we, we need to learn more. Okay. okay. Thank you for the opportunity. It was my pleasure. <laughs> yes. And it was a great, yeah. great way to finish the year in our seminar. So thank you very much for this too. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we will come back to the seminars on the 14th of January. Until then, uh, have a great Christmas and Happy New Year. But we, we will meet again uh, in our uh, lunch, Christmas lunch, <laughs> Christmas celebration during lunch today. So bye-bye. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.